Section 4 of J. S. Bach by Albert Schweitzer Translated by Ernest Newman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto Chapter 4 The Chorale in the Church Service How was the congregational song introduced into the church service at the time of the Reformation? It is usual to look upon the question as very simple, and to suppose that the people had little by little come to sing the melody while the organ played it. Did the sacred instrument really teach the congregation in this way? We may read through all Luther's writings without finding a single place where he speaks of the organ as the instrument accompanying the congregational singing. Moreover, he, the admirer of true church music of every kind, gives no directions as to how the organ is to cooperate in the service. It is really incredible, however, that in the few places where he mentions the organ at all, he speaks of it not enthusiastically, but almost scornfully. He does not look upon it as necessary or even desirable in the evangelical service, but at most tolerates it where he finds it already. His contemporaries shared his view. We need not be astonished that the Reformed Church dealt drastically with the organs and banished them from the churches. In the Lutheran and even in the Catholic churches at that time it fared almost the same. It had always had indeed its adversaries. No less a person than St. Thomas Aquinas had declared war on it, not regarding organ music or indeed instrumental music in general, as calculated to stimulate devotion. In the 16th century, however, complaints against it arose on all sides, and the Council of Trent, 1545-1563, to which dealt with all the doubtful questions relating to the Church and its service, was compelled to enact severe regulations against the erroneous and too prevalent employment of the organ in worship. Catholics and Protestants alike at that time imposed on it a term of penance, in order that it might alter its ungodly nature, in default of which the Church would excommunicate it. It had fully merited this disgrace. The character of the tasks allotted to it may be seen from the Ceremonial Episcoporum, issued by Pope Clement VIII in the year 1600. The organ preludized in order to give the tone to the priest or the choir. It further gave out the liturgical songs and hymns in alternation with the choir, one verse being sung and the next played on the organ. It was never used, however, to accompany the choir. The primitive structure of the organs of that time quite forbade this. The heavy keys did not permit the polyphonic playing, while their crude, untempered tuning made it, as a rule, impossible to play on them in more than one or two keys. Since, therefore, they could not cooperate, the choir and the organ functioned in turns. When the organ had completed its verse, the text, in accordance with the above-mentioned regulations of the Pope, was either recited loudly by a chorister or else sung which latter was recommended as the better course. With the organ employed in this independent way, abuses could not fail to creep in. As the organist was unable to play polyphonically on his instrument, he was tempted to amuse himself with quick-running passages in his preambles to the verses or during the course of these. Still worse was it when he indulged in well-known secular songs, which seems to have been a widespread practice. In 1548, an organist at Strasbourg was dismissed from his post for having played French and Italian songs during the offertory. At a later date, the organ unwarrantably deprived the choir of many of the hymns, taking almost everything upon itself. The extent to which this had become prevalent appears from an incident that happened to Luther, which he tells in his best style in the table talk. When I was a young monk in Erfurt, he says, and had to make the rounds of the villages, I came to a certain village and celebrated Mass there. When I had dressed myself and stepped before the altar in my fine attire, the clerk began to strike the Kyrie Lyson and the Patrem on the lute. I could with difficulty keep from laughing 
for I was not used to such an organ. I had to make my Gloria in excelsis conform to his Kairi. It seemed so much a matter of course at that time to substitute the organ for the choir in the liturgy that this clerk, in default of an organ, simply had recourse to the lute. In the evangelical church, the role of the organ had for a long time now been the same as in the Catholic church. It preambled to the hymns of the priest and the choir and alternated with the latter. Only now the congregational song is merely an addendum, to which the organ preambles and wherewith it alternates. In Wittenberg, it preambled to almost all the vocal pieces, whether of priest, choir or people, and shared with the choir in the rendering of the Kyrie the Gloria, and the Agnus Dei. We learn this from Wolfgang Musculus, who in 1536 attended the Concordia conferences at Wittenberg and described the singing at the service in the Wittenberg Paris Church on the fifth Sunday after Easter. This explains the curious injunction which we find in the church ordinances of the 15th and 16th centuries, namely that the organ shall strike into the song in the churches, it means that certain verses are to be played by the organist alone, the congregation being silent. At the same time, the caution is given that this must not happen too often, but at the most two or three times in one hymn. It is so laid down in the Strasbourg Church Ordinance of 1598 and in exactly the same way in the Nuremberg Congregation Ordinance of 1605. At first, and for another three generations at least, there was no question of the organ accompanying the congregational singing. How did the choir stand with regard to the congregational chorale? Did it take the place of the organ, guiding and supporting the song of the people? A glance at the earliest hymn books appointed for the service shows us that this solution also did not occur to Luther. The above-mentioned Erfurt and Kiridion of Justus Jonas was a hymn book not for the church but for the home, as indeed its title expressly indicates. The melody alone was noted over the poem, so that the father of the household could give it out to the children and the servants. The Strasbourg reformer, Katharina Zell, hoped that a poor mother should go to sleep, and if at midnight the crying child had to be rocked, sing it a song of heavenly things. This would be the right kind of lullaby, and would please God more than all the lullabies played on the organ in the Catholic Church. The church chorale book published at Wittenberg in 1524 by Luther and Walther, while the Enchiridion was being printed at Erfurt, made no reference whatever to congregational singing. It merely consists, in fact, of the vocal parts of chorales written in four and five parts, and the cooperation of the faithful is barred at the outset by the fact that the chorale melody lies in the tenor, not in the soprano. These vocal parts, which were probably engraved by Luther's friend, the painter and wood engraver Lucas Cranach, are those of chorale motets sung by the choir, and therefore having a cantus firmus, as was customary in the religious and secular music of that time. Luther was not only a reformer, but an artist. The logical outcome of his reforming ideas would have been a remodeling of the church service on the lines of the simple home service, in which case the congregational chorale would have been the only music used in the church. This indeed is the line we find him pursuing in his first a dramatic treatise on the service. But, as in most men of genius, there was a fatal side to his greatness that prevented him from thinking out his ideas to their logical conclusion, and made him endow a thing and its antithesis with equal life. He was an admirer of the contrapuntal music of the Netherlands school. He regarded artistic music as one of the most perfect manifestations of the deity. When natural music is heightened and polished by art, he said once, their man first beholds, and can, with great wonder, examine to a certain extent. For it cannot be wholly seized or understood. The great and perfect wisdom of God in his marvelous work of music in which this is most singular and indeed astonishing that one man sings a simple tune or tenor, as musicians call it, together with which three, four or five voices also sing, which, as it were, play and skip delightedly round the simple tune or tenor, and wonderfully grace and adorn the said tune, 
with manifold devices and sounds, performing as it were a heavenly dance, so that those who at all understand it and are moved by it must be greatly amazed, and believe that there is nothing more extraordinary in the world than such a song adorned with many voices. The wonders of the contrapuntal polyphony have never been so admirably described before or since. His favorite composers were Jusquin Vepré, 1450-1521, the court musician to Louis XII of France, and Heinrich Isaac's pupil, Ludwig Senfel, died in 1550, who was successively in the service of the courts of Vienna and Munich. His remark upon Jusquin is well known. He is the master of the notes. They have to do as he wills. Other composers have to do as the notes will. On one occasion, when a motet of Senfels was being performed in his house, he called out, I could not write such a motet if I were to tear myself to pieces, just as he, for his part, could not preach a sermon like me. The musician in Luther could not tolerate the banishment of the choir and art song from the church, as many people desired, or the restriction of the choir to leading the congregational singing. And am I not of the opinion, he says in the preface to Walter's Chorale Parts of 1524, that on account of the gospel, all the arts should be crushed out of existence, as some over-religious people pretend, but I would willingly see all the arts, especially music, in the service of him who has given and created them. A license was thus granted to the art in the Lutheran service. It took its place in the ritual as a free and independent power. All the phases of the development of music in general are to be clearly seen in the Lutheran service. Finally, when the motet under the influence of Italian art was transformed into the cantata, bringing not only instrumental music but an undisguised opera style into the church, the service actually came to be interrupted by a sacred concert, which was looked upon as its culminating point. It was at this juncture that Bach came on the scene. On the covers of his scores, he writes not cantata, but concerto. Thus, had Luther not been an artist, Bach would never have been able to write his sacred concert music for church purposes and as part of the church service. Would he nevertheless have written it in any case? What would he have done had he been born in Zurich or in Geneva? At first, the congregational chorale was not supported either by the organ or by the choir, but sung unisono without accompaniment, precisely as in the Catholic Church at the end of the Middle Ages. We must not overestimate the number of the congregational chorales that were sung during a service. Where a choir existed, the congregation took little part in the singing, being restricted to the credo, sung between the reading of the gospel and the sermon, and perhaps a communion hymn. In Wittenberg, it so appears from the account given by Musculus, the congregation, as a rule, did not sing, but left even the chorales to the choir. In other places, Yearfoot, for example, it was customary for the people to sing alternately with the choir between the epistle and the gospel, in such a way that the choir sang the sequence, and the people joined in with a German chorale appropriate to the time of the year. Five or six chorales in the year sufficed for this, since the same chorale was used on each Sunday during that particular period. In the churches that had no choir, more importance attached to the congregational singing, since in that case the Kyrie, the Gloria, and the Agnus Dei were sung in the corresponding German chorales. But here again, as a rule, fifteen or at most twenty chorales, which had been laid down once for all for their particular Sundays, sufficed for the whole year. On closer inspection, we get the impression that the congregational singing instead of gaining ground, was in the course of the 16th century driven back by the art singing and by the organ, the pretensions of the latter increasing everywhere, in spite of all ordinances. There was thus good cause for the attempt that was made at the end of the first century of the Reformation, not indeed by a musician, but by a priest, to improve the position of the chorale. In 1586, the Wurtemberg court preacher, Lucas Osiander published his Fünfzig Geistlich Lieder und Salmen mit Fiestimen auf Kontrapunktweis für die Kirchen 
und Schulen im Lublischen Fürstentum Württemberg, also gesset sit, dass ein ganzer christlich gemein Durkhaus mitsingen kann. Fifty sacred songs and psalms for the churches and schools in the worshipful principality of Württemberg set contrapuntally in four parts in such a way that the whole Christian congregation can always join in them. This was the first real chorale book in our sense, except that it was written for the choir instead of for the organ. The fact that Osiander relies only on the choir, not on the organ, for the leading of the congregational singing, proves that the instrument in his time had no concern whatever with the latter. In his preface he expresses his confidence that he has made things easier by removing the melody from the tenor to the soprano, and thinks that when the laity recognize the tune they will joyfully take part in it. Was not his confidence misplaced? It was indeed only a half-measure, a false compromise between polyphony and melody. If he wanted polyphony, he should have allowed the whole congregation to sing in chorus in four parts, as was the custom later in Switzerland. On the other hand, if he wished to do without polyphony, he should have let the choir sing in unison, acting, as it were, as pre-cantor, somewhat in the way the village cantors in his day led the chorale without choir or organ, simply by the unison singing of the school children. His desire, however, was to reconcile artistic singing and popular singing, and instead of a solution, he achieved only an unstable compromise. For what support could the harmonies of a choir, and the choirs at that time were very weak in numbers, give to a cantus firmus sung by a mass of people? Hans Leo Hassler also tried to make a forward step in this direction, and published besides his splendid Cantione Sacre and Sacri Concertus for performance by the choir only, his Kirchengesang, Salmen und Geistlich Leder of De Gemenen, Melodien mit vier Stimmen Simplicitaire, setzt, which, according to the preface, were so constructed that the ordinary man could sing them in the Christian assembly to figure it music. It would be wrong, however, to suppose that all the masters of church music, who in the 16th and 17th centuries removed the melody to the soprano part, were imitators of Osiander, and that it was for purely practical reasons that they abandoned the earlier system. The real reason is quite different, and must be sought in the fact that in the meantime German church music had shaken off the influence of the purely contrapuntal music of the Netherlands school, and had fallen under that of the Italians, in which the melodic style began to dominate the contrapuntal. Melchior, Vulpius, Seth, Calvisius, Michael, Praetorius, and Johann Eckhardt thus follow in their admirable music not so much the lead of the Wurttemberg court preacher as the trend of the art itself. It was a pure accident that through this change in polyphonic art the possibility was opened to the congregation to join in the cantus firmus with the choir. How far it availed itself of it we do not know, for in the history of art as a rule we never get to know the things that would be of practical interest to us for these, being looked upon as matters of daily custom, are not recorded. The fact that at this epoch the term chorale begins to be applied to the melodies sung by the congregation throws no light on the question, unless we regard it as proving that by this time the melodies of the church song had ceased to be congregational property and had become the property of the choir. In any case, the composers themselves, in spite of the fine practical suggestions as to the congregational singing that they put forward in their prefaces, thought only of the choir when composing, as is shown by their counterpoint, which, with all its simplicity, becomes richer and more and more in the style of the motet. For us, these chorale pieces, with their singularly beautiful blending of Italian and German art, are choral works pure and simple and the idea of trying again the experiment of letting the congregation join in them would not occur to us, but if only we could hear them even as choral works. When will the time come when these treasures are exhibited each Sunday in our church services? The attempts to have the singing of the congregation led by the choir were made about the end of the 16th century, 
and in the first decade of the seventeenth. By the middle of the seventeenth century, the question is settled by the organ assuming this role. In 1650 appears the Table Tour, book of Samuel Scheidt, with a hundred chorale harmonizations intended for the accompaniment of the congregational singing. This was no thought-out experiment, but a solution arising out of the facts, that is, the progress of organ building. The sacred instrument had in the meantime been made more practically fitted for polyphonic playing and endowed with such fullness of tone that it overwhelmed the small and weak choirs of that time. Whereas hitherto it had accompanied the choir, which supported the singing of the congregation, its powerful tone now made it possible for it to assume the lead. But again, we cannot be sure of the date at which the organ began to support the choir in the chorale, or when it began to cooperate with the choir in general. This was certainly not the case before the beginning of the 17th century. Vulpius, Pretorius, Eckhard, and others appear to know nothing of it. But as early as 1627, Johann Hermann Schein, cantor of the St. Thomas's Church of Leipzig, adds a figured bass intended for organists, instrumentalists, and lutenists to the four, five, and six-part chorale pieces for the choir in his cantionale of that year. And this most probably points to a joint performance by choir and organ. We must not, however, conceive the organ accompaniment to the chorale, as it was practiced in the second half of the 17th century, as a supplanting of the choir by the organ in the chorale. The choir, even in Bach's time, cooperated in the chorale as in earlier times, polyphonically indeed, although the organ took the lead, as it were a kind of second and stronger choir without words. This transference of vocal polyphony to the organ by means of chorale accompaniment was of cardinal significance to the art of organ music. The chorale was a teacher of the organists, leading them from the false and fruitless virtuosity of the keyboard to the true, simple organ style. From this moment, German organ music, music severs itself from that of Italy, France, and the Netherlands, and always under the control of the chorale, pursues the path along which, in the course of two generations, it was to arrive at perfection. Scheidt, already in possession of the true organ style derived from the chorale, sees that his life work consists in combating the colored organ style of the school of the Dutchman, Swilink. It is an illustration of how an idea is, in the end, always stronger than circumstances. Organ music did not come to perfection in Paris or in Venice, where everything seemed to be in its favor, but among the poor cantors and schoolmasters of an impoverished country, as the Germany of the two generations after the Thirty Years' War was. How small Frescobaldi, the organist of St. Peter's in Rome, whose fame among his contemporaries was so great, seems besides a Samuel Scheidt, whose name was unknown on the other side of the Alps. From the moment when organ, choir, and congregation together gave out the chorale, it was inevitable that the antiphonal method under which the organ alone performed certain of the verses should sooner or later fall into disuse. But of the perfection of these independent organ renderings at that time, we may judge from Scheidt's Tablatura Nova, published in 1624. It consists for the most part of a species of variations upon the chorales most generally used, the number of variations corresponding to the number of verses of the song, and upon the hymns of the various seasons of the church year, which at that time were still sung in Halle in Latin, and not as in other places in German. In addition, there are liturgical pieces, such as the Kyrie, Gloria, Magnifica, and the Salmus Sub Communioni, Jesus Christus Unser Heiland, which are all treated in the same way. The Celli Tablature, that appeared 23 years earlier, is on the same lines, except that it also contains the complete catechism songs. How long the custom testified to in all contemporary tablatures of rendering vocal pieces on the organ alone, still lasted after the process of decay had once set in, can no longer be ascertained. When we consider the extremely numerous arrangements by Bach of the chorale, Allen got in der Husse air, we are inclined to think that even down to this day, there persisted under certain circumstances 
the practice testified to by Shait of the organ responding to the Gloria intoned by the priest at the altar. As to the position of the congregational singing in Bach's time, we have only conjecture to go upon. One thing at any rate had been achieved. The number of the hymns affiliated to the service had considerably increased. Each gospel had one or more of these allotted to it, so that the same ones were always sung on a particular Sunday. They were called the Cantica de Tempore. In the hymn books they formed the first class and were arranged according to the Sundays of the ecclesiastical year. The cantor selected them himself without consulting anyone else. In our day, on the contrary, the hymns are always selected by the clergyman to tally with the spirit of his sermon. The use of the Cantica de Tempore helps us to understand how the organists of the time of Pachelbel and Bach came to write cycles of chorale preludes for each Sunday of the ecclesiastical year. Whether the congregation took possession of all these hymns and took an active and hearty part in the singing of them is, however, another question. It is well known that Madison and the famous Hamburg musicians thought nothing at all of the congregational chorale, and in general refused to recognize singing of this kind as music. From this we may conclude that it did not occupy a prominent place in their churches, and that they, for their part, did nothing to encourage it. It must have been the same in other towns that had celebrated choirs. The cantata, that sacred concert intercalated in the service, absorbed all the interest, and the art song, as at the beginning of the Reformation, had once more triumphed. We do not know whether things were better in this respect in Leipzig than in other towns. The truth is that no remark of Bach's had come down to us to show that, in contradistinction to his contemporaries, he felt any particular interest in congregational singing. In his passions, at any rate, he does not desire its cooperation, in spite of the splendid role that he assigns to the chorale in those works. If is highly probable that in Bach's time the singing of the Leipzig congregations was not so good as is commonly supposed. Not until the concert style of music was banished from the service in the generation after Bach and the town choirs that had been allotted to the churches ceased to exist did congregational singing become the characteristic and sole service music of the Protestant church. In the epoch of rationalism and pietism, the ideal was realized which the Reformation had indeed perceived, but for conservative and artistic reasons had not pursued. However barbarously rationalism behaved towards the old hymn, it did good work for congregational singing. Its ultimate aim, of course, was to substitute a new kind of hymn for the old, the diction and the ideas of which had by then become so antiquated as to unfit it for use as a real congregational hymn. Whether the problem has been really solved by allowing the organ to support the congregational singing is doubtful. The method has established itself, because it is practical, but the ideal is not congregational singing of this kind directed by and dependent on the organ. The true ideal is free and confident, unaccompanied singing, as in the congregational singing of the Middle Ages and of the first Reformation period. Perhaps that complete and unfettered cooperation of organ, choir and worshippers was, in its way, an ideal towards which we shall someday aspire more than we do now. End of chapter 4 Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama